Modern. 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 We're prepping for a voyage. Modern. The force of an old fashioned equals whiskey mass times bitters acceleration. Why don't you make that a double? Modern Bar Cart. What's shaking, cocktail fans? Welcome to episode 188 of the Modern Bar Cart podcast. I'm your host, Modern Bar Cart CEO Eric Koslick. Thanks for joining me for another interview episode where we track down the best and brightest minds in the spirits and cocktail world so that we can share their secrets with you. This time around, we have a fascinating nerd out session with Dr. Eric Stroud of Mohawk Spirits Distillery and nanodistilling.com. He's here to talk about an innovative research program he's undertaken that involves resurrecting and reimagining ancient still designs and testing them in a modern laboratory setting. This ambitious project has really exciting implications for distillers all over the world. But before we start talking about stills that look like they were ripped from the pages of Da Vinci's notebooks, let's pause for just a moment so that you can make yourself a drink. This episode's featured cocktail is the Corpse Survivor Number no. 3. That's right, not the all popular number no. 2, but its little known highballish cousin. To make it, you'll need one and a half ounces of absinthe or pernode one half ounce lemon juice, and chilled champagne, or any other dry sparkling wine. In a highball glass with ice, combine the absinthe or absinthe substitute with lemon juice, top off with champagne, and enjoy. Pretty simple, right? Now, I'd like to point out that the Corpse Reviver family of cocktails is a problematic one in terms of unity. There's not a whole lot of either ingredient or formulation correspondence that would make you think, ah, yes, here's a Corpse Reviver. The original two takes on the Corpse Reviver appeared in Harry Craddock's 1930 Savoy cocktail book, and number one is basically a split-based Brandy Manhattan featuring Brandy, Calvados, and Sweet Vermouth, and number two is the iconic gin, orange, liqueur, lemon, absinthe drink that many cocktail aficionados know and love. The recipe I just shared with you comes from Patrick Gavin Duffy's 1956 official mixer's manual, and we can see the resemblance it bears to the Corpse Survivor number two. It's got absinthe and lemon, of course, but instead of gin and orange liqueur, you just load up your glass with champagne. To me, this is a logical extension of the Corpse Survivor format. The only two qualities that seem to make a drink a Corpse Survivor are multiple French ingredients and the explicit or implied directive that this is a drink to be taken in the morning or with brunch. So more serious mixologists might roll their eyes at the Corpse Survivor number three, but I think it's a welcome and unpretentious addition to the slightly chaotic Corpse Survivor pantheon. Plus, this episode's all about reviving old and strange looking contraptions, which means this cocktail fits right in. So, now that you've got a long, refreshing drink in hand, let's turn our attention back to the interview. In this stimulating still dialogue with Dr. Eric Stroud of Mohawk Spirits Distillery, some of the topics we discuss include the differences between traditional and vacuum distillation, that is, distillation that takes place in the presence of high heat, versus distillation that takes place at room temperature but under high pressure. How Dr. Stroud secured a grant from the American Distilling Institute that allowed him to fabricate and test ancient still designs found in alchemical and medical texts from the Renaissance and Enlightenment. What it's like to test glass stills with zigzags and coils and chambers that seem to be in all the wrong places. The implications of Dr. Stroud's compelling test results for the craft distilling industry, as well as what new experiments are on the horizon the virtues of working with native North American fruits and berries, what to drink with a late Renaissance alchemist, and much, much more. If you're a distiller, if you understand even just the basics of distillation like I do, or if you just generally care about people doing creative stuff, this is a fascinating episode. I hope you'll check out some of the awesome resources that Dr. Stroud has published over at nanodistilling.com, and more generally, I hope you're as excited as I am about the fact that our frontiers just keep on expanding before us as we continue to learn more and more about the art and science of distillation. With that, please enjoy this fascinating deep dive with Dr. Eric Stroud of Mohawk Spirits Distillery. Dr. Eric Stroud, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Eric. Happy to be here. Uh, so 
We've got a lot to talk about today, a lot of uh, subject matter that is probably going to be a bit foreign to our listener base, which makes me excited. That's why we're here, to learn. Uh, but can you just kick us off by introducing yourself and tell us, uh, telling us basically who you are and what you do? Okay, great. Sure. Uh, my name is Eric Stroud. I'm a chemist, and I've studied a lot of exotic things. I've looked at invasive species and shark repellents and natural products. I've worked a lot in the pharmaceutical industry. And uh, all along this time, I've worked in distillation. It's a key component of our laboratory. And so I had been drawn to creating a craft distillery in around 2014, 2015. I wanted to just set it up um, on my own. And the state of New York made that very easy. And so I became a farm distiller in 2015. Um, I still am very much involved in organic chemistry and working with pharmaceutical companies and medical device companies. But I also enjoy distilling. And that's the other half of my life. So I basically have come out of a laboratory with distilling and brought it into craft distilling. Yes, uh, you have one of the better domains out there. Maybe not as good as the ADI domain, distilling.com, but you, you've got nanodistilling.com, which is, which is pretty good. Um, so uh, just tell us, give us, give us the quick rundown on your farm distillery, uh, what kind of products you produce, and then I'm sure we'll return to some of the technical stuff uh, later on down the line. Oh, sure. Um, well, as a farm distiller in the state of New York, it means that we have to use 75% of the agriculture that's grown in the state or more. So it keeps the product very close to the land, the terrain, the climate, everything. Um, I've always been interested in fruit. And so we grow fruit on our farm. And everyone in upstate New York grows apples. So I didn't want to do that. So I had to pick something weird. And so we grow pawpaws and we also do berries. And really, the only two products that I make are pawpaws and strawberries, a strawberry liqueur and a pawpaw liqueur. And it's all grown in upstate New York on our farm. I'm a nano distillery, really, because it takes a lot of fruit to produce some liqueur. Um, the yields are very low. Um, we are at the whims of Mother Nature at all times. We had snow last night and the buds are just coming out on the trees. And, you know, in May, if we have a killing frost, I'm not going to have a lot to make a product. And in some years, we have bumper crops. It makes it very challenging, but there's never a lot. So a nano distiller means I'm working out of 55-gallon drums and about 20-liter distillation pots. It's very hands-on. It's very small, a lot of attention to detail. Uh, but that's the nature of a farm distillery. We grow the food. Uh, that's the input to the mash. And we also distill it. And um, when you're working with fruit, those are small quantities. For sure. So, so what you're saying is that you are uh, creating essentially a brandy using these pawpaws and strawberries rather than simply using them to flavor an existing spirit that you put sugar into. That's correct. Mm -hmm. um, there's enough sugar in a strawberry and a pawpaw to ferment. It's not great, but there's enough to produce alcohol. I can certainly infuse neutral spirits with pawpaws and strawberries and come up with some amazing, um, delicious products that are really close to the fruit. Um, and I've also done eau de vies. With the little bit that I can, I can get uh, eau de vies. And remarkably, they're pretty close to the fruit, especially when you do it very carefully. Um, so I'm, I've specialized really in those two things. We have lots of berries and, and interesting things like medlars that grow in upstate New York. And I'm going to try to develop products around that. Persimmons are very cold hardy. Um, these are future products. If I have enough yield, we can always move into that. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Pawpaws are sort of notorious in that they have such a short window for, for harvest and then, and then use. Um, there's only one distiller down here in the mid Atlantic that I know, uh, Baltimore spirits company uses them in their Pechuga style smoked apple brandy. Um, so another mm -hmm. sort of fruit based distillate application there for pawpaws. And I think that's, that's, um, you know, it's certainly a, a flavor that, that is surprising and, and a little bit foreign or exotic to people, uh, even though it grows native here in the sort of Northeast mid Atlantic. So, uh, I, I think it's a, it's a really interesting product to work with, but, uh, we're not just here to talk about your interesting spirits. We're here to talk about a project or a series of projects that you have, uh, recently been awarded a grant from, from the American distilling Institute aforementioned. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about what it means to do vacuum distillation 
and sort of ease us into this wild series of experiments that you've embarked on, uh, because I don't know that our listeners are going to understand the nuances between regular distillation in a pot or column still versus vacuum distillation. So I think that's a great place for us to start. Okay, certainly. Um, there are a few craft distillers that are using vacuum. Uh, basically, what it means is you can distill a wash without applying a lot of heat. When you are heating um, the wash, you are basically speeding up oxidation a bit, right? It's exposed to the air and you're cooking it. So if you have delicate notes in it, when you cook it, you're speeding up the reactions that might take away some flavors. It might caramelize, it might go into maillard browning. Things happen and the flavors change because of the heat. But when you apply vacuum, you don't need that heat requirement. You're lowering the vapor pressure on top of the wash and it makes it easier to, to boil. And so those delicate flavors aren't cooked. They're coming off at room temperature and you're collecting them and distilling them. So your distillate is very close to your wash and the notes that are coming out of your fermentation. They're very close to that. Um, so you eliminate that variable of what did heat do? Did I overcook it? Did I overheat it? That's gone. Now you're very close to whatever the, the yeast have left after your fermentation. And if you were careful, if it was clean, you got some amazing fruit notes and delicate esters that will come across. Mm. And by wash, you mean what we would refer to as a distiller's beer or a distiller's wine, correct? Exactly. The thing that you would rack after fermentation, clear, ready to be charged into the still. Um, with vacuum distillation, you know, it's it's not too hard to do. I built my distillery much like a chemistry laboratory. So everything is in glass. Everything looks like, um, you know, a manufacturing floor for a pharmaceutical. Um, these are heavy wall glass reactors. And the vacuum pumps are not exotic. These are two, two cycle pumps that you might find in HVAC work and things like that. But they will pull down to about 29, 29 and a half inches of mercury. And that's all you need to boil um, an alcohol and water mixture. And you could do it right at room temperature. And it's quite remarkable. And it'll be sitting in a room at 72 degrees and you open up the vacuum lines. And then in a couple of minutes later, it's boiling. Now, the thing about vacuum, it's interesting. As you keep that boil going under vacuum, the temperature of the wash goes down. And so you have to add a little bit of heat, just a little bit, to overcome what's called the heat of vaporization. If you keep pulling vacuum on it, it actually gets colder and colder and the boiling ceases. So you have to give it a little oomph to drive that alcohol off and get it into the condensers. Um, all the while, you know, this is cold stuff, right? You're, you're distilling at room temperature and you've got to get now the distillate cooled and condensed. So we don't use water in our distillery. We use glycol. And glycol is something that you can really chill down well, well below the freezing point of water. You can get that really low. You don't waste anything. It's just a loop that just keeps recirculating. And that's what you need, right? So especially if, if your product is a vapor at room temperature, you've got to get that 40 degrees lower than that. And then some more. So we have to use some exotic chillers to do that. Um, but the rest of it is really straightforward. And vacuum distillation is actually quite easy, except for the condensing part, as, as I found it. This is fascinating. Uh, already, I've got some things that I, that I want to highlight a little bit here. Now, the conventional wisdom when it comes to distillation versus fermentation is that distillation basically takes the notes from fermentation and focuses them or, you know, sort of distills them, right? Makes them a little bit more intense. Uh, but one of the really key points that you've brought up here is that, of course, in traditional distillation, there's a lot of heat and heat is a, is a very um, sort of dynamic actor upon organic compounds, right? It, it has the power to radically transform these things, whether that's through oxidation or um, any other sort of degradation that may occur. So it's really interesting to me that you immediately drew this, this uh, distinction between vacuum distillation and traditional distillation in that the vacuum distillation keeps a much more faithful flavor profile to what the yeast produced. Now, I don't necessarily think that this is a value statement. It's sort of just an objective fact. Vacuum distillation closer to the ferment, uh, traditional distillation adds a little bit 
kind of evolves the flavor a little bit further uh, and perhaps in a different direction. So I think that's a super important thing for our listeners to keep in mind. Now, the other thing that just kind of blows my mind. And I do not have any sort of scientific background here, but I've taken enough distillery tours to, uh, to kind of sit up and pay attention to the fact that like, you know, we're doing something at room temperature that really doesn't have any business being done at room temperature, except that it's under this very intense amount of pressure. And, uh, it's interesting to me that you have to then like, chill it down even further. You would think that because you're doing something at room temperature, it must be, oh, well, like condensation should probably be not that big of a deal. But, you know, it, it, if you step back and think about it, it kind of makes sense that you'd have to kind of super chill things down. So it's it's fascinating to hear that one of the trickiest parts of vacuum distillation is actually that that chilling and condensing aspect, which, I mean, is a thing in regular distillation, but it's certainly not one of the more difficult aspects of the process. So uh, those are the two things that that kind of st- stick out to me immediately as being very different. Um, are there any other differences between vacuum distillation and traditional distillation that you found uh, through your experiments and, and distillation runs? Well, it's, it's a whole different world. Um, you remember, you know, if you're in vacuum, you're in a closed system. Nothing is open to the air. And a lot of, you know, a normal distillery has a parrot and they're watching the alcohol purity in a parrot as the distillate comes through. You can't do that in a vacuum. That has to be totally enclosed. It's very difficult to build a parrot inside of a vacuum. Um, what I find the most challenging is as you're going through your run, how do you know what proof is coming off in the distillate? So if you want to take a sample, you have to break vacuum, get the distillate out, measure it, put it back on, pull vacuum again, start over. There's ways to do it, and there's ways to do it with uh, needle ports and cannulas. You can get in there and not break the vacuum and get enough out. Um, But it's difficult, actually, to really know at a point in time what's your proof, because everything is sealed in a vacuum, you know, a completely air-free environment, and you can't touch it. You can't get in there and, and touch the fluid or the liquid and measure viscosity. You can't taste it. It's sealed. So if you want to get to it, you have to get inside the vacuum or you have to break the seal. And then you lose some time doing that. So by experience, I know, all right, some general rules of thumb that I know if I'm pulling vacuum and I'm doing something, I'm going to discard my my four shots and my heads. I know roughly where my hearts are in it just from experience. And that just comes with time and what you're doing. Uh, But starting off, you're going to be putting the vacuum on, taking it off, doing a sample, putting the vacuum back on, taking it off. Um, that's, That's kind of challenging. Um, the other thing about vacuum is those vacuum pumps really love to suck the vapor and the gases out of those, those flasks. And that includes your alcohol. And it will suck the alcohol vapors right into the vacuum pump. And that's really, really a lousy situation to be in. Then you have to change the oil in the pump. And then if you pull vacuum too hard in your, in your pot, the oil in the vacuum pump sometimes wants to escape and start heading to your still. You don't want that. So what's unique about vacuum distilling is you have to have traps, uh, what we call cold traps. And the cold trap is there to keep the alcohol from getting to the pump and to keep the pump oil from getting to the still. And so you have two traps. The oil stays here in the vacuum pump and the alcohol stays here towards the condenser side. If you don't have the traps, your good stuff and your hearts and everything actually might exit right out through through the vacuum pump. And uh, I speak from experience. (laughs) So that's. That's all fixed now. <laughs> That's great. Well, you know, one of the things that strikes me as as very similar uh, between your uh, sort of self described laboratory or manufacturing facility style distilling environment and practices versus what we might consider a much more uh, traditional or Uh, maybe even slightly primitive style of distilling like they do uh, down at certain, you know, very rural palenques in Mexico is the fact that, you know, when when we hear some of these people romanticize about agave spirits, oh, you know, X X or Y mezcalero, he goes to the still and he doesn't have any tools. He he knows by, you know, uh, being taught over generations in his family and just by being able to look and smell the alcohol coming out and, and checking out Las Perlas, the, the, the way it bubbles exactly where uh, to make his cuts and exactly what proof it's at. And you're kind of, you're, you're sitting in what would comparably be a hyper 
technologically advanced setting with a completely different set of equipment saying like, yeah, I kind of have to do the same thing. Um, and, and so it's, uh, that, that's a little parallel that that's, that's very interesting to me. Now, um, can you uh, tell us a little bit about, uh, some of the experiments you've been working on revolving around, uh, still shape and, uh, maybe how you uh, got a grant for that through the American Distilling Institute? Sure. Well, when you research and you do a lot of chemistry, you, you have to look back a lot on where did we come from to come to like a reaction or an understanding or a formula. So you like to always look backwards. And I found myself doing that um, just sitting in the still room and just looking at the stills and like everything's a pot still or a column still. And you begin to wonder, well, how did we get here? Is this the best? So um, I found the book and this was the book that that changed it all and it's the uh, the short history of of distillation and it's written by rj forbes it's an old tome this is not a modern book and i read this cover to cover and then i read it another time and this gives you an appreciation of how did we end up with our modern still so he takes you back into like the 15th century 16th century and in this book are these scattered drawings of these unusual stills from the 16th, 17th century, predominantly around that time. And I've worked with a lot of distillation equipment and condensers in my time in the, in the laboratory. And the things I saw in, these, in this book was like, I've never seen anything like this. It's so bizarre. And then you, your first impression might be, well, it was fanciful. These were philosophers, alchemists, hermeticists, and that's why no one does this anymore. And then you keep reading. Right. So this book hands me off to some other books. And I, it got my interest. I started to read about these guys that came up with these unusual shapes and these strange designs. And these were learned men. These were doctors trained at universities. These were people that not only knew alchemy, but they also knew the state of the art chemistry at the time. They were working on medicines. These were learned people. So now it got my attention. You have a guy that may have done a degree at Oxford in chemistry and had a royal position in teaching chemistry, and he sketches out a bizarre distillation apparatus. Now I'm wondering, okay, why did this disappear from the history? Where is, where is it as of the 1800s or 1900s? So the whole basis of the ADI grant was, these are very unusual designs. We don't really have a good explanation as to why they disappeared from the literature, and we don't see anyone using these modern day. Let's recreate them. And let's do them with modern materials. Let's do some modern temperature control, you know, proportional heating. Uh, we've got digital alcohol meters. Let's, let's use our modern know-how and apply it to these shapes and see what happens. Um, the ADI liked the idea. And with the grant, we were able to reconstruct um, five of these stills. And the thing about these old manuscripts is they don't really give you a lot of how-to. They don't give you dimensions or ratios. They'll just say a cone shaped like a sugar loaf. And there's just one picture. And you don't know if it was 20 feet tall or 10 inches tall. So we had to make some educated guesses. The glass blowers had to look at this and decide how do you even build this? In the 16, 1700s, glass blowing was emerging, right? It was a new technology, it was getting better. Scientific glass blowing was nowhere where it was today. And even our modern glass blowers had to do a double take on some of these and figure out how do you actually build this out of glass. We did it, we ran it, the results were amazing. Completely unexpected results came out of these. So what we've done with this grant is basically shown that some of our predecessors, our ancient distillers that helped to get us to where we are today, had a lot of foreknowledge. Even if their ideas were never built, they were kind of on the right path and they were starting to understand rectification and what unusual shapes can do about alcohol purity. So that's where we are. And now I am totally um, absorbed by this. <laughs> and this is like a whole research focus in the distillery now. That is incredible in a word. Um, you know, I, I tend to agree with you, uh, although I, I don't have as, as much uh, evidence behind this uh, standpoint as, as you do, but I, I tend to agree that a lot of the people who are working during the 15, 1600s, uh, I, I don't, I don't think we give them enough credit for how much they did actually know because 
I was uh, doing an episode where I was researching certain uh, plague-related distillations, so um, Four Thieves Vinegar and um, Plague Water and some of these other um, either distilled or macerated uh, what we might call like uh, remedies for for the plague. Um, Whether they worked or not is a a separate issue, but uh, I remember coming across a recipe for one of these uh, things, it might've been uh, aqua mirabilis, I think. And I, I looked at this recipe and, and the process, and I, I do believe that it's specified like using a small glass still, right? So probably a tabletop thing or, or maybe a little bit bigger. And I, I sent the recipe off to one of my distiller friends uh, to sort of like do the math that I, I'm not qualified to do. And I was like, hey man, like, can, can you just run the numbers here and tell me about what proof this is coming out? And, and they actually had a, a really sophisticated knowledge because uh, he's like, yeah, it's, it's going to come out about this proof. This would sort of be like what, a, what our modern distillates would come out as, but this is using a glass tabletop still probably during the late Renaissance or early Enlightenment time. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, think it's, I think it's really compelling. And, and this is a particularly rich area to dive into um, I'm, I'm a little bit confused as to where to go from here, because if you go to your website, nanodistilling.com, uh, you have some crazy pictures of these still shapes and, and anybody who goes to visit will completely understand why these modern glass blowers probably had a very difficult time replicating some of these things. So can you give us, um, an example or kind of walk us through some of these still shapes and, and why, why you chose them for this grant? Certainly. Um, there are, you know, stills that started off very simple, um, a cucurbit or a very simple alembic. You find these going back to, you know, 2000 BC in Cyprus. Not really interesting. But when you start to see zigzags and pretzel twists and stills and condensers that are inspired by mythological animals like the Hydra and the Gemini twins, you know, those jump off the page at you. And that that image just really sticks in your mind. I'm like, I've never seen anything like that. And so that that's what really generated my top 10 list of still designs that really I take a look at here. Um, narrowed it down to five. Um, I honestly looked at it and I couldn't really decide how it would work. Um, I, you know, when you look at a zigzag, um, a vertical zigzag that starts from the boiler and goes up to, uh, um, you know, an ambix. It's like, okay, what would happen in the zigzag? Is the vapor just going to go up and then condense in the top? We really don't know. So it was probably the most bizarre shapes, really, that that caught my attention. Um, They didn't necessarily have to build them in glass either. Um, I'm building them in glass because to really know what's going on inside, you have to see where the liquid vapor interactions are, right? Um, A modern craft distiller, now that we know it works, they can go to Home Depot and get plain old copper tubing and put this together in one night. Um, but you can't see what's happening inside. You can't see the phenomena, right, of going on. Um, liquid vapor interfaces and things like that, how the distillate is traveling through it. That's why it had to be in glass. Um, so um, that aside, who knew what the ancient guys did? I don't know if they had access to metals and metal tubing like we do. That's probably a stretch. Glass and ceramics were probably commonplace to make some of these shapes. Um, but Eric, I have to tell you, I, I sometimes doubt they even built them. These might have just been great ideas and they put it forward, but never actually put it into practice. These were just their best guesses and they published it. And hopefully maybe someone later on w- was going to do it. That's interesting. This episode is brought to you by Near Country Provisions. If you're like me, here are some things you might be like. You live in the Mid-Atlantic. You enjoy meat. You highly prefer that your meat is local, sustainable, and comes from ethically raised animals. And you'd absolutely love for someone to deliver it to your door once a month. If this sounds like you, then you need Near Country provisions in your life. Head over to nearcountry.com and check out their different, highly customizable meat delivery packages, and also browse their growing seafood selection. As a thank you for being a Modern Bar Cart listener, you can get two free pounds of ground beef or bacon included in your first order after subscribing if you enter the code BARCART, all one word, at checkout. That's BARCART, B-A-R-C-A-R-T, at checkout. Near Country Provisions is 
the real deal. And I can honestly say that I'd recommend them even if they weren't a sponsor. The meat and the local farmers they work with are just that good. Now, back to the show. I was going to ask if the fact that you're doing this using vacuum distillation is actually a potential confound, assuming that most of the people who were doing it originally didn't have access to pumps and vacuums and and stuff like that. So, but the point about doing it in glass so that you can see what's happening, actually visually monitor the vapors and the process and see the, the impact that the, the still shape has on the end product. And and of course the process is super valuable. So it makes complete sense that vacuum distillation and glass is an excellent place to start so that we can develop an actual conversation about this so that then somebody can go and run the experiment using heat and using metal or other materials. So I, th- I think that makes a lot of sense to me. So in an experiment, generally you're measuring something. And if you go to some of these blog posts on nanodistilling.com, you know, you'll see these nice, very scientific looking um, diagrams where it seems like something's being measured. And I have no clue how to read those or communicate that to my listeners. So can you walk us through what you are actually measuring during these tests and um, you know, what sort of findings you had relative to the numbers? Certainly. Eric, if I could just take a step back, one, one important thing I have to mention is the ancient stills, are they're not under vacuum. Um, I'm only running vacuum on really my production stills at the distillery. Um, the ancients are heated. Um, they would have been heated with a fire or they would have been in a bath, what they called ab uh, balenum, which is just a hot water bath. Um, but for these, these are sitting in electric heating mantles and they're open to the air. Um, so I am doing it the old way. Um, like you said, vacuum would be a bit more confounding um, without even knowing how they work. You know, like vacuums, like the next second or third step after it. So these are really heated stills kind of done the old way. Um, so as far as measuring, it's very simple. Most important thing is temperature and purity. Um, with these ancient stills, I'm using a standard electric heating mantle. And you can just put in a set point. I'll say I want to go to 80 degrees Celsius and type it in. And the thermocouple watches the wash and holds it right there very precisely. It has a magnetic stirrer in it, so it's very well mixed. And I'm watching the temperature on the columns. And uh, one great way I, I do that is with little stick-on liquid crystal thermometers. And you can apply them right to the, gr- the glass and see in about f- plus or minus five degrees what's going on along the whole thing. Um, on the output, I'm using standard digital alcohol meter, snap meter. And as it's going, I'm just taking samples and over time and temperature, I'm just recording the alcohol purity. And that's what creates all those graphs. So what you're seeing there um, is really just purity over time or purity versus temperature. Um, and that kind of gives you what we call a character- characterization of the still. Um, we know where the strongest alcohol is coming out at roughly what temperature in the boiler or over what period of time. That's fascinating. Um, so were you just sort of distilling to get almost like a vodka? What what were the what was the raw material that you were putting through these stills? Well, to start off with, I got to start super simple. So um, I made what's just called a binary solution. It's vodka. It's water and ethanol. That's it. So it's forty percent ABV ethanol. And so to just to start there, you know exactly how much ethanol you have. And the exact volume, I know every characteristic of it, its viscosity, its boiling point, its azeotrope. So we start there and you put in a 40 percent um, wash into one of these stills and 80 proof and you come off the top at about 187 proof. It's rectifying it. So like that, that's quite remarkable. Um, so then now we know how it works with vodka. Let's do something a little bit more complicated. And then I'll load in like a great mark wash, a 10 percent, 20 proof. And the 20 proof will also go up to 186, 187 proof off the top, rectifying on first pass. It's fantastic. Um, These strange shapes are acting like a column still. They're acting like a a bubble cap or a pack column or a tray type still. They're creating lots of interface area. And that was totally unexpected. I thought these were just going to be fancy short path condensers, to tell you the truth. They're not. They work like real columns, and that's really neat. Um, so yeah, we, we basically start with vodka, very simple because it's so well known. 
see how it performs, and then gradually introduce tougher stuff, right? Sugar. Now add solids. Now add ethyl acetate. Whatever's coming from the fruit. You know, that's always changing and interfering with the boiling points. But you got to start simple somewhere just to understand how it works. And for us, that was vodka. You got to get yourself a grad student, man. <laughs> I do. I have an intern. Um, <laughs> And uh, she's helping me out now, so it's it's good. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. Because uh, what I was going to ask is is if you were you were able to do any sort of sensory analysis, but I, I also sort of assumed that you were probably starting off with something as neutral as neutral can be, because you know when we run studies like this, and I'm saying this in the first person plural, having never done it myself before. So, but I'm assuming that when one runs a study like this, uh, you you want to start. And, and get as much basic information as possible at the outset so that you can run with some assumptions later on down the line. You, you want to take something that is a known unknown, turn it into a known known so that you don't need to necessarily worry about that too much. Or if down the road something changes with that, ah, now you've got something to dig into as, as a potential variable. So it, it makes a lot of sense to me. And, you know, you're saying you were, you were surprised by, um, the fact that some of these were, were working like column stills. It's when, when I first saw the zigzag, uh, still shape, I looked at it and I was like, well, those must act kind of like plates, right? Like reflux. Yes. Um, so yeah, I, I, it's, it is certainly compelling and, and I will echo the sentiment that some of these still shapes are just bizarre. Like the, the Gemini one, is that the one where it looks like two people almost hugging? Yes. <laughs> um, the Gemini is that, that came from, uh, Gian Battista della Porta from Italy, um, 16th century. And, uh, I have to tell you, it looks super cool. That is probably the least remarkable of, of the ancient stills that we built. That one actually behaves kind of like a pot still and a short path. Looks really cool, but it doesn't rectify like the zigzag or the pretzel twist or the cone. Um, it's just different. Um, I keep it on the bench because it's just fascinating. Um, you have to sit down and think about what does the crisscross mean? And then you realize it's just a boiler with two outputs and it, they condense in two different paths. And then when you see it with your eyes, you're like, this is totally how it works, but really cool. But that again, that that's that thing. These guys took their inspiration from like mythology or animals or nature. That's how that design came up. And you see that design throughout all types of hermetic and alchemical manuscripts, mm -hmm. you know, what they call the circumambulatory or the digester, you know, it's, it's supposed to greatly purify things because it's always recirculating and always purifying Mm, in craft distilling, not that great. <laughs> fair, fair. Uh, the way the way you describe this, uh, like the need to see what's actually going on in order to sort of wrap your head around how these stills work reminds me uh, a lot, actually, of the work of uh, Leonardo da Vinci, where he would study the hydrodynamics of of water in a certain container or you know moving in a certain way, and he would draw the actual physical paths that the water would take and it, and it ended up being incredibly beautiful and looking like human hair and his notebooks and just very, very beautiful. So I, I, I think that we're still, uh, kind of working within the Renaissance tradition here of, of, uh, of curiosity. And what I, what I like about this too, is that it, it, it resonates with me because I'm somebody who is a big advocate for affordance theory, which is basically walking up to an object, picking it up, turning it over in your hands and asking yourself, what does this thing do? You know, and we can we can actually get pretty far on some basic assumptions and, and with more complicated shapes like some of these stills that you're working with. Well, the affordance process is a little bit more in depth, but, you know, we can we can still make a little bit of progress just by running some very basic tests, uh, which leads me to what are, what's next? What's on the docket for this ex, these experiments down the line? Uh, what other variables are you interested in looking at? And is there are the are there any uh, real world or maybe large capacity applications that you're interested in in playing around with? Certainly. Um, well, you know, probably one of my favorites is the zigzag, the Lefavre um, apparatus, and the obvious questions are. What if the angles change from 90 to something else? What if I added more zigs? Can I get to 192 proof at the top? Can I make it shorter 
with more zigzags or short, you know, and or different half lengths, different angles. You know, if I'm going to do it this time, I'm going to do it out of copper because that's very easy to do. But I mean, very straightforward. Now that we know that, say, six or eight zigzags gives you 187 proof. Why don't we add three more, five more and see what the yield becomes? Um, then start to play with the diameter of the path um, relative to the boiler. And that's how you'll get start to have some ideas of how it could scale up. Um, and then maybe a real distiller out there, you know, with a 500 gallon pot can look at this and say, wow, um, I might be able to rectify right off of this with just a zigzag. And remember, they're air cooled, which is the fascinating thing. There's no water. There's no glycol. It's just you keep the room cool. And, and that airflow past it is what does the condensing. So from an energy perspective, it's quite fascinating as well. I really think that these guys, you know, in Europe, they intended for these things to be used like a, like an Armagnac distiller. Like it's it's the fall, it's cool outside, there's a fire underneath it, and these stills become very efficient. Um, when I did a lot of these studies, it was the fall into uh, the winter, and it's great um, because I wouldn't turn the heat up intentionally, and those condensers become very efficient. Um, you probably don't want to do it in the dead of summer. Um, these are things to play with, though. Well, I don't actually know what the efficiency is as the room temperature increases. That's a very interesting study. At what point does it become inefficient? And does the proof drop off if the room is 80 degrees? Right? Stuff like that. Lots of opportunities to go. I'm still kind of interested in building more. And um, the Perlatus apparatus is one we just built. Um, there's a couple more bizarre designs. I'd just like to try to build this year to kind of round it out. Maybe, maybe three more designs. And then I think I've got a really good handle on uh, what these ancient guys were doing. And we could conclusively say things like 90 degree angles or tight bends or cones give you rectification because, like you mentioned, they create theoretical plates. Now we know this as a community. Any craft distiller now knowing that can start to experiment with some cool shapes. You never know. Someone might come up with a hexagon uh, condenser or something and, you know, and uh, octagon and gives you some amazing stuff. I mean, sky's the limit now that we know we've got something here. Right. Yeah. And, and would you expect that some of your findings would change as you scale volume? Because I not a distiller, but I, I do make cocktail bitters. And, and one of the effects that we encounter when we go from something that's like a test batch or a, a small one liter batch to something that would be say 15 or 30, 50 liter batch is that the extraction occurs a little bit differently. You, you can't get away with simply scaling one to one and expecting the same flavor outcome. So is that something that you expect to be a factor down the road as you try this with larger and larger stills? Absolutely. It's going to be challenging. These things do not scale linearly. Um, you have to do a lot of trial and error. With these ancient stills, what I found out, you know, when I first set them up, you know, I sat down and like, let's crank it and start boiling. You can't do that. It will just shoot the hot vapor right out of these things. Um, these ancient guys were patient. And that's a virtue that comes out of this. When I sat down, I'm like, it's, it's too hot. It's too fast. You have to go gentle. You have to go slow. You have to put enough energy into the boiler to move the vapor through, let's say, 20 feet of zigzag, but not more than that. So you're shooting it out the top. So when you scale up, now you have, okay, I increased the diameter. Now I've got to go through 100 feet of tubing. What's the energy input so that only it's making it to the top of the column and not past it, where I'm going to lose the efficiency and just hot vapor is going to shoot out the outlet? That takes a little bit of trial and error. Um, you have to build some incrementally sized stills, get your data point to really know what this versus this does and what path length changes are. Yeah, it's it's challenging. Um, you're not going to go from my size to like Tito's on a linear scale up, impossible. Um, this is gonna take some trial and error, some creativity, um, but there will be a magic ratio or something that comes out of this where people are gonna be like, okay, it's one inch of diameter per you know liter of the boiler. And the energy input is this many kilowatts per gallon. And then you'll know around those parameters, okay, this is how big you can make it, right? But these things are gentle. Um, you're, you're cooling by air temperature. You're trying to force hot vapor through long glass tubes. And you got to get those glass tubes to thermal equilibrium gently. And so um, I like to think that these guys, that's the way they did their science. They were patient. And they had to just get those parameters right. We're a bit more frantic in the year 2021. And I think we want instant scale up, instant capacity, 
instant economics of scale. It, it, it's not like that when you work with these ancient designs. It's it's going to take trial and error and some patience to, to do the scale up. And that's, I think, one of the reasons why I'm happy that we have a true craft distiller leading this research right now. Um, what, what makes me excited about the research is the opportunities that it, it holds. And, and right now, those opportunities are certainly theoretical in that we have a lot of trial and error to go before we can reliably, you know, like you mentioned, find that golden ratio that we can just, you know, plug in as, as a K, as a constant. But um, I, I, it's exciting, right? You're, you're, you are at the you know, the bleeding edge of this research. And my hope is that people will take what you've been able to put out there and be able to take really, really careful notes on this. Because, you know, like you said, you have to be slow, you have to be gentle. There's, there's a bit of finesse to this, right? But just because there's a bit of finesse doesn't mean that it's all art, right? There is some science here. And so I dearly, dearly hope that as people experiment with these still shapes, that they're able to take scrupulous notes on what they're doing. Uh, Has anyone approached you saying, you know, that they'd like to help out or do some of this research in a different place using different materials, but using some of the specs that you've you've, uh, started off with? Uh, Unfortunately, not yet. It might just be a little bit too weird. Um, The invitation is open. If anyone wants to come over to uh, Mohawk Spirits Distillery, uh, just drop me a line. And happy to give the tour, or if you want to bring something to the still, we can study it together. But uh, not yet, Eric. It hasn't quite, uh, I thought, uh, caught on. Um, hopefully, the podcast will push it out there. It's so easy to do now that it's you know the proof of concept is done. It's it's really trivial to build one of these things, you know, out of again like copper or standard tubing. Um, I, I really encourage people to try it. I think they'll be very surprised. You might we might make another discovery out of this. Yeah, uh, I'm. I'm very specifically looking through the airwaves at all of the distillers who are listening to this in the mid Atlantic and beyond. Uh, You heard it. It's an open invitation. uh, And I'm going to ask you next time I come to your tasting room, did you listen to the weird, crazy stills episode? And the answer better be yes. And you better be in touch with Eric because I want to see more stuff coming out of this. So I will I will harass people on your behalf and uh, people who are doing really, really good stuff because uh, we've got a we've got a at least here in the mid Atlantic. We have a a really solid bunch of people doing cool stuff. So I'd I'd very much like to get somebody up there um, to, to kind of help out and see what you're doing, because I think this really could spread. And I think that's really where the value of this project would start to pick up and, and, and grow be, uh, you know, is, is when people start doing more experiments and, and taking notes and, and so that we can actually aggregate data rather than just having, you know, one person's set of notebooks, we've got aggregated data. Um, you know, we've got different environments, right? Like you're in upstate New York, but you know, what if somebody's doing this down in the Caribbean using a completely different humidity and completely different, you know, it's not going to get cold down there. So it'd be, you know, kind of nice to, to, to see what, what goes on in a, in a different place as well. So I, I really think that there's, there's a huge opportunity here and, um, you know, I, I just hope that people, um, people jump on now. Um, you know, I, I guess my, to, to kind of wrap things up here, uh, you know, I, I, I think in looking to the past, right, you, you're sitting there combing through these, you know, 15th, 16th, 17th century texts and, and illustrations, and, and you're seeing what people were doing, even if it was just sort of in their imaginations. Uh, I, I think that looking to the past is, is a great way to reflect on the present and project into the future. Um, it doesn't have to be necessarily regarding still shape or still size or, or any of the things that you've been experimenting with, but what do you think uh, the future has in store for us in the craft distilling landscape? Did, is there any trends that you're excited about or, or any any opportunities um, that you see either in your own work or, or uh, otherwise? Mm-hmm. Well, certainly one, one of the things that was very fascinating um, is the distillery out of, I believe it's Brooklyn, if not certainly in the five boroughs, who's able to produce um, ethanol basically out of the air, right? So this is catalysis. These are nanoparticles that are reactive um, that can combine with carbon dioxide and react to assemble ethanol. Now that's great stuff. It completely eliminates seasons and bugs and pests and fruit and fermentation and yeast. Um, You know, you're able to synthesize alcohol 
um, just the standard chemical combination processes. I wonder how that's going to move through the industry. All right, right now the materials are pretty exotic and expensive, um, but you know prices do come down over time. You wonder if the craft distilling um, would actually head to that. It really removes, I guess, the craft part of it, like the whole idea of growing your own and you know the taste of the rye from New York versus another state. That that's gone. You get your neutral spirits basically via a simple ca catalytic reaction. Um, that's very cool. One thing that I'm really interested in, and um, I'm not really sure anyone's doing it in craft right now, is um, per evaporation. So you can you can separate ethanol um, from fluids using um, membranes, um, special semi-permeable membranes that select for the size of the water molecule or the ethanol. And this is well known and it's well studied. Um, I just don't know if anyone craft is doing it. And so uh, I've been talking around a couple guys to see uh, what kind of spare membranes are around and maybe try it out on the bench and just see what flavors come through it, what flavors don't, um, how easy is it to reuse. That would be kind of cool. Uh, per evaporation techniques. Again, no heat, no, no condensers. It's basically gravity moving through a membrane or a little bit of pressure on the top moving you know, you're washed through a membrane and then seeing what comes out on the other side. So I'm looking forward to that, actually. That's kind of a personal curiosity. <laughs> That's fantastic. And it seems like we're now finally getting to a point where we're doing the things that a lot of these, you know, Renaissance folks would view as just like complete magic, right? We're, we're able to do things that they, they never in their wildest dreams would have imagined, which is certainly exciting. Uh, and yeah, I, I think you're right. And I think maybe this is what I was getting so excited about in terms of the opportunities for more people to start running tests on, on these alternative uh, still shapes is because I, I want to see what what the flavor situation is. You know, on your end, you, you've been you've been laying the groundwork for us in terms of you know purity and some of these really basic things that we want to eventually make some assumptions about instead of just wondering about. But I'm extremely excited about being able to taste some stuff that comes off of these stills. You know, using the same still to run a barley, to run a wheat, to run a corn, to run different mash bills, right? Like you know, the 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 the, the variations on this theme are pretty much endless. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm very excited to hopefully get to a point not too far down the line where, where I can actually uh, sidle up to one of these stills, stick a, stick a cup under it and uh, capture some liquid and, and taste it. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely uh, have to keep close tabs on, on you and your experiment. And uh, again, I do encourage all the distiller folks uh, who are listening to, um, you know, to reach out and we'll have your contact info uh, at the end of this episode for sure. So Eric, is there anything else that you wanted to share with us about the projects that you're doing, anything that you're working on before we jump into the lightning round here? Um, well, uh, we've got some interesting research going on. Um, it, I'll just share that it involves magnetism and it involves some exotic um, salts. And we're looking at how that can affect the separation of alcohol. Um, I reached out to the ADI about it, so we'll see um, how that, that goes. But we're seeing some really fascinating ways to make the alcohol easier to get out of the wash, um, using exploiting some of the characteristics of salts and the way that ethanol and water want to come together in hydrogen bond. Uh, that's what makes distillation difficult. And so if you can disrupt that hydrogen bonding, the ethanol is easier to get out. So we're playing with that right now. This is very small scale stuff, but it's looking promising. So that's about it on this front. <laughs> that's a lot though. That, you know, you say that's about it, but you, you just listed a whole laundry list of things that you're working on, um, which is, which is very exciting. And uh, so I, I, I will definitely be, be following. I'll be subscribing to your blog and, and making sure that I get updates as, as we, as we learn things. And I might even teach myself or, or have my wife teach me how to read some of these, uh, some of these charts that, that, uh, that come out of these experiments. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, so you ready for some lightning rounds? Let's do the lightning round. All right. First question, what's your favorite cocktail? And if you don't have a favorite cocktail of all time, what's something that maybe you've been experimenting more with lately? Oh, I'm very easy. Uh, Manhattan is my favorite. And if that is made with a New York rye, that's the best. Nice. So you're a Hudson fan? I am. Very nice. Yep. Yeah. They make, they make a good product. Um, 
Is there any product now? We, we talked about like distilling trends, but are there any product, uh, any products in this the spirits and cocktail world that, that you think are um, perhaps underappreciated at the moment? Um, well, you know, because it's so cold in New York, we tend to grow fruits and berries that a lot of people haven't heard of. Um, it would be great to see these penetrate the market. Um, medlars, service berries, uh, stuff like that. Um, you know. Everyone sees, you know, a blackberry or an elderberry liqueur or a blueberry. Um, and we need to see some of the other berries uh, make their way in. Aronia, right, black chokeberry, is one of my favorite berries. And it's got such a great taste. And uh, it would just be great to see more products like that. Um, and, you know, it's grown throughout most of the country. So why not? And these are easy things to grow. They're cold tolerant. So I would like to see more products like that out there in the shelves. Mm, for sure. I just saw an Aronia gin somewhere. I don't know if it was here in the mid-Atlantic. I think it was maybe like a pink gin where they where they made the gin and then steeped it in the Aronia. But um, but yeah, yeah, certainly um, some of the, some of the um, like you said, more cold tolerant plants. I know that uh, our friend Peter Alf over at Mount Defiance Distilling uh, actually takes a takes a trip up to New York each year to get his uh, black currants because New York is one wow. of the few states that doesn't prohibit uh, the growth of that particular plant. I guess there was some sort of invasive plant or um, or illness, but New York it seems is one of the places where they can still thrive. So, um, so yeah, I certainly agree with that. Now, if you could have a cocktail, anybody on earth, past or present, who would it be? Where would you go? What would you drink? Just kind of paint us a picture. Well, you know, you mentioned Aqua Mirabilis, and that is a recipe from the esteemed John French from the year 1650. And um, I've read his works, and um, I would pick that gentleman. So here's a guy that compiled all of these great recipes and cocktails um, throughout all of alchemy and, and, and ancient times into a book. And he put it forward in his book to any humble reader to acknowledge his work and hopefully learn from it. Seems like a really cool guy. So I would picture myself, 1650, we're in England. I'm sitting down with John French, and we are going to taste the aqua mirabilis, as he describes in his book. Probably not a lot of the other ones, um, because they're pretty weird, uh, but that one looks pretty healthful and pretty safe uh, from the recipe. So that would be great. I would love to hear his story of who gave him the recipe and where did he find it from. So... Yeah, yeah, so many fascinating. I mean, like, and this is this is sort of the same time frame where you know a carriage rattles into the Carthusian uh, kind of conclave in Paris and drops off the elixir of long life recipe for that eventually became chartreuse. This is, you know, when all of these, all of these kind of crazy botanical spirits, uh, were being developed anyway. So certainly a rich time to visit. And, uh, and yeah, I'm going to have to go back to that episode and, and see if it was indeed John French, uh, that I, that I was looking at there because, um, you know, I think that that was, that was a lot of fun for me to investigate as well. Um, last question here. Do you have any unusual or controversial views or beliefs in the spirits world, cocktail world, distilling world? I, I guess nothing too uncontroversial or, or weird. It's really, uh, I guess the thing that I'm, I'm interested in is truth and labeling. Um, it is hard to grow your own fruit, harvest it, make the alcohol, and come up with a product that's great. And I see distilleries pop up and they're on the shelves in their first year. And that's frustrating. And I guess I would just love to see more of, you know, something that, you know, forces us to say, like, I'm the distillery and I grew this or I sourced my material here. I definitely distilled it. I did not buy it from the Midwest. I did not infuse it or buy aged material. Like, just give us the truth in the label. That would help me. I mean, it's hard, right, to justify a $25 bottle of a liqueur in upstate New York. But that's how much expense and labor and effort needs to go in that to get enough fruit to produce a quality product like that. And so like, I wanna exclaim that on my label, like this is hand picked by the Amish, processed by me over many, many hours. And there's nothing fraud about this, right? We're not buying the alcohol from out of state, you know, or anything of that sort. Um, I just want to see more honesty, I guess, around stuff like that in, in the craft spirits. Like, let's put that front and center, you know, mm -hmm. right on the label or on the back. <laughs> 
Yeah, I think one operation across the pond that does an incredible job with that is Brook Lottie. They're, um, they're going above and beyond in terms of transparency, and, and they obviously have, you know, some some money behind them and, and they're able to do, uh, some of this stuff. And, uh, but yeah, in terms of, in terms of transparency, I, I, I do agree. And, and I think the, I think that conversation also extends to, you know, new products, uh, you know, so if we're doing low ABV X, you know, low ABV gin, for example, is something that I've, that I've heard about. It's like, well, is it gin though? Is it, you know, can we just call it something else? And, and I, I just, I don't care. I may, I may very well enjoy that product, but I just want to know what it is uh, mm-hmm. without be, without worrying that somebody is just pitching me something. Cause then, then what happens I think is as a quasi informed consumer, I get distracted. I'm, I'm sitting there like all of a sudden I'm on my guard. I'm like, Oh, like, all right, what do you, what do you, what exactly are you trying to tell to, to, to sell me rather uh, instead of just enjoying the experience of drinking it? Uh, and so I, I think there's there's that case to be made also. But yes, transparency, something that's very much near and dear to my heart as well. Um, Eric, this has been a huge treat for me. Uh, great opportunity to nerd out on stuff. And I'm sure that a lot of our listeners are very excited to uh, to look into what you've been up to. Can you tell us the best way to find uh, information about your experiments, for example, uh, information about your products and your distillery, and then maybe be- how best to digitally get in touch with you. Okay, great. Uh, well, everything going on on the research front is going to be up at nanodistilling.com. Um, my distillery is Mohawk Spirits Distillery, and that's at mohawkspirits.com. We're in Canajahari, New York, in the beautiful Mohawk Valley. Um, it's still snowing, um, but give me a month and it'll be beautiful and come on up and see the beautiful farmland and, and the river valleys. Um, I'm, I'm pretty basic. I'm, I'm not really on social media much. Uh, best way to get me is probably email. And simply it's Eric, E-R-I-C, at MohawkSpirits.com. Beautiful. Well, I'm I'm based when I'm visiting my childhood home out of the Pioneer Valley, just a little bit east of you. So uh, I think I think this is a great excuse for me to uh, maybe maybe sneak out on one of my next road trips home and uh, and come come see these stills in person. Would love to have you, Eric. It would be a great time. Awesome. Uh, Dr. Eric Stroud, thanks so much for being on the podcast. You're quite welcome. Great to talk with you. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's two big things you can do for us here at Modern Bar Cart. One would be to tell your friends and family if you think they'd enjoy listening to us talk about cocktails. And if they don't download podcasts, they can always stream our episodes on their desktop directly from the show notes page at modernbarcart.com. The other thing you can do to help would be to head on over to iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts and leave us a review. Five stars are great, but we're more interested in your feedback. And the beauty is, the more reviews we have, the easier it will be for other folks out there to learn about our show. We're trying to start a cocktail revolution here, and by spreading the word, you're helping us fight the good fight. You can always reach us by emailing podcast at modernbarcart.com if you're looking for cocktail or bartending advice, or if you're a pro who would like to pull up a mic and be interviewed for all to hear. Also, definitely follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Modern Bar Cart for cocktail porn, recipes, and entertaining tips. And keep an eye out for new product releases and special offers, which are happening all the time. We love our listeners and we really enjoy giving you exclusive discounts and sneak peeks at our latest and greatest cocktail projects. This episode may be over, but for you, the mixological fun and adventures are just beginning. So remember folks, drink responsibly and experiment boldly. This episode was made possible with editing and sound design by Samantha Reed. Ancient still experiments courtesy of Dr. Eric Stroud of Mohawk Spirits Distillery and a little bit of interview magic by yours truly. This has been a Modern Bar Cart production, copyright 2021.